right. So as far as that as that goes, uh, the Constitutional Convention. Now, the thing is, the articles, the elite consensus, most of the elites in America at the time felt like the articles were not working. OK, the articles weren't working. So why aren't the articles working? Now, first of all, there's a bad economy. Wars will do that to you, especially if you're on the side that's not as well financed. Uh, there's a bad economy. These continental notes, not worth a continental. Shay's Rebellion. The other thing is that if there is civil unrest, okay, if, if, there's, if there's civil unrest in a state and a state can't muster enough force to put that down how do we deal with that because under the articles there was really nothing to handle civil unrest now remember that really with the articles of confederation uh what you're what you're looking at there is essentially a military alliance all right so when you're thinking about the articles of confederation you're thinking in terms of a military alliance it really wasn't that much different than nato or something like that except uh, a little bit tighter than that because you know they declared war they sent common ambassadors so you wouldn't have an ambassador from south carolina or from massachusetts you had a, an ambassador from the united states so the main job of this government under the articles was to conduct foreign policy and so now what do we add here now somebody asked something about tariffs now what we're seeing here is under the articles that the states had complete control over over commerce, all right? The states had complete control. And so the federal government didn't really have any kind of, uh, you know, couldn't, I mean, that's really until the 20th century, the federal government under the constitution financed itself mostly through tariffs. And so that's what's going on at that time. And yeah, it's mostly tariff financed. And so with, with that, uh, before the constitution, there was really no way for the federal government to finance itself because they didn't have the ability to tax. Now also, North Carolina could put a tax on, let's say, tobacco from Virginia or something like that. So the states had complete control over tariffs and commerce, which some of that's going to be yielded to the federal government later on. Now, the Annapolis Convention is something uh, something that's good to, uh, you know, to add to just to know about as an antecedent for the Constitutional Convention. You're not really going to need to know like the specifics of what went on there, but it was a meeting of representatives from about five states or so. Now, there was also, let me just real quick, there was a question. Yeah, so Brittany, the Newberg conspiracy, just real quick. Now, this is an example of something that'll never be on your exam, like you're not going to see it. But it was a conspiracy of Continental Army officers who were planning something of a military coup uh, during the time of the articles. And then George Washington went to their meeting and he he went to he went to their meeting and he had a prepared statement and he took out his spectacles and he put them on. And as he was putting on his spectacles, he said, my apologies, I have gone blind in the service of my country. And then it was like, oh, and that pretty much shut that down. Hey, OK, well, I think that's going to need to wait for a little bit. Okay. You want to say hey to everybody? Oh, hi. All right. Thank you, Caroline. OK, but anyway, it's it's a cool little story and something that is not going to be on your exam. All right. And so when we see the tariff of abominations again. That's going that's something that's really kind of outside of the scope of where 80 percent of the people that are like way outside of the scope of where 80. Well, I think when we add that up, like 90 percent of the people here aren't there. So. As far as that, uh, as far as that goes, the Annapolis Convention is an important antecedent uh, for that. And so let's meet again next year with more people. So that's the Philadelphia Convention. Now, the Philadelphia Convention, what's very important as far as your big understanding about the Constitution is that the Constitution is a product of numerous compromises. And that's important because, you know, they make compromises at the convention and then they make compromises after the convention during ratification. And so with that, the stated purpose of the Philadelphia Convention was to amend the Articles of Confederation. Okay. 
So as far as that goes, amend the articles. Now, we know that's not going to happen, okay? This is something that it ends up getting a lot bigger than that, that the Philadelphia Convention ends up going way beyond its mandate of amending the articles, and they end up creating a completely new document. And that's, of course, our Constitution. And so they start from scratch with this. And then as far as understanding the Constitutional Convention, I think of it, some of y'all are familiar with Dr. Seuss, right? And I, you know, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish, think large state, small state, slave state, free state, okay? So you've got a compromise between the large states and the small states, and then a compromise between the slave states and the free states. And these are the, the biggest compromises that are made here. And so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, you've got, uh, you know, these large states. Now, Virginia, you can see, let me zoom in here, that Virginia has 20 percent of the population now. But note here that 39 percent of that population is 30, 39 percent of that population is enslaved. All right. And so the thing is, if this new government is not going to count those people in terms of population, that could be a problem if, if representation is determined by the uh, you know, by the population. And so south of the Mason-Dixon line, of course, you see some of these states have you know, quite a bit of slave population. Now, as far as that goes, uh, the so when you look here, uh, you see the northern states. Now you've got Massachusetts, uh, you've got Pennsylvania, which are the larger states there. And of course, when you look at the slave population in north of the Mason-Dixon line, only six percent of the population. Where, whereas, excuse me, whereas fifteen percent south of the Mason-Dixon line, and of course concentrated in states like you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia, okay, and, and Georgia. So really, yeah, it looks like here, Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia really having the, the most in Maryland. So with that, every state's coming there with their own agenda, and they want to get as good of a deal as possible. So the legislative branch, that is Article One of the Constitution. And so the biggest thing is, how are we going to constitute Congress. And so how do we share power? For example, if my wife and I are sharing a dessert, uh, how are we going to split that? Are we going to split it 50-50 or are we going to split it proportionally? I might think, hey, I'm bigger. I should get more, right? And so this is where you see the Virginia plan, the New Jersey plan. Now I've got everything on the New Jersey plan written in small letters here. Now the Virginia plan was was proposed by James Madison, and he proposed a bicameral legislature. Now, there is a question here about that. Jackson has asked me, what is the difference between a unicameral and a bicameral legislature? Now, that means, I guess, uh, cameral means house in Latin, okay, because it unicameral means one house, bicameral means two houses. And the federal government has a bicameral legislature, which means we've got the Senate and the House. So we've got two houses and both houses have to pass legislation in order for something to become law. Now, this is supposed to be a check on the legislature and make the legislative process more difficult and that consensus building should play a role in this, okay? So, so when you're looking at unicameral versus bicameral, 40, I believe 49 states have bicameral legislatures. I think that Nebraska has a unicameral legislature, if I'm not mistaken. And so, yes, the bicameral legislature means that we have two houses. So with this, the Constitution, now the Articles had a unicameral legislature. The Congress was just one house. You didn't have a two-house legislature. So with that, we're done answering that one. And so James Madison, with the Virginia plan, has a plan for a bicameral legislature and it's based on population. Whereas William Patterson, now he's trolling a little bit here. There are some of you who are probably familiar with trolling. 
And what William Patterson in New Jersey, now you don't necessarily need to know Patterson's name for the exam. James Madison would be good, but you'll probably never see William Patterson come up by name. But a unicameral legislature with one vote per state. Now, the thing is, isn't that what we have right now? Okay, so William, you know, New Jersey plan is like, weren't we here to amend the articles? What is the, uh, you know, what is the deal here? And so, you know, we should be here to amend the articles and that's what we want to do. And so you've got this impasse. Now, of course, Hamilton's plan is worth mentioning, uh, but kind of as an aside, because we really need to understand where Alexander Hamilton is coming from. And remember that this was a secret meeting. All right. So this was the pro this was a secret meeting. So what everybody said, what happens in Philadelphia stays in Philadelphia. And Hamilton proposed this idea for a national government. So he said, how about we create a government that just makes the states like just all they're accountable to the federal government. All of the sovereignty is with the federal government and the states are basically administrative districts, kind of like if you look at France where they've got their departments and that sort of thing. Those those departments in, Fr in France, they're not states because they don't have any of their authority, but they are organizations of local government. Now, Hamilton's plan was not taken very seriously by the convention. This is not why they were there. Now, the Constitution represents a major change from the Articles, and it adds powers to the central government, but it does not destroy federalism, this idea that the state should have powers that are theirs and the federal government should have powers that belong to it. And so with that, the convention heard Hamilton's plan, didn't debate it. So really it comes down to the Virginia plan versus the New Jersey plan. And with that, we've got the Great Compromise, Roger Sherman of Connecticut. You, As long as you know Great Compromise, you should be fine. But you know, it never hurts if you like uh, trivia and stuff like that. Okay, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, uh, you know, we see the great compromise. And what he says here, now this is bicameral, but remember that Madison's plan had both houses being determined by population. And this plan came from the largest state. This was the large state plan. And so what Roger Sherman proposes, how about the House of Representatives, the lower house is based on population. Whereas the Senate, the upper house, you have two senators from every state. And so with that, uh, you know, they're saying, OK, this will satisfy the large states and the small states and have a consensus. Now, the other thing about the upper house, the Senate, is that Senate, the senators are going to be appointed by state legislatures. And this is another thing to note. I've actually got a podcast that I'm editing right now, and I'm really going into how our constitution was not really created to be a democracy. Now it was created to have democratic elements, all right? So that there should be an element of democracy in the constitution, but the Senate was intentionally designed to be a more aristocratic body. And this is where you see with the current, uh, with the Kavanaugh hearings, that's going on in the Senate. The House doesn't get to advise the president on things like judicial appointments. That stuff is done by the Senate. And so then the House of Representatives, that is the uh, the House of Representatives, that is the uh, the Democratic House. So you have a combination of aristocracy and democracy, which is what the framers intended. And of course, the United States has has become a you know a more democratic country but the foundation of our government is not democratic you look at most uh, most european democracies they haven't gone with our system of government they've gone with the, the parliamentary democracy system which is really built around the idea of democracy and majority rule and that sort of thing but the senate of course when people say the electoral college isn't democratic i say well if you think that you might want to look at the Senate because the Senate is less democratic than the uh, than the Electoral College. Okay, because 
California gets two senators and Wyoming gets two senators, even though California has you know, several times the population. So the next question is the slave states versus the free states. And so should slaves be counted for purposes of representation? And so what happens here is the three fifths compromise. Now, you don't have to know this for your exam necessarily that this comes from a funding formula. Like as far as the states when that when money was requested of them, uh, you know, the slaves would count as three fifths of a person or something like that. But you can understand where the southern states want to make sure that they're represented, because if you only have the free population of the southern states, they're not going to have a whole lot of representation in the house. And so then again, if you have slaves counted and then you start thinking if you're from the north, like, are you going to let them vote? Are they citizens? Like, are you really just trying? I mean, you want to treat them like property legally, but you want them to count toward representation. So you can see that there is some, uh, you know, some resentment here on the part of the north. But the delegates from South Carolina and Georgia, they're threatening to walk out. So that's why the Constitution, it's not the document that anyone wanted per se, but it's the document that people could agree on it, it, that we're in this room with the result of some give and take. And of course, you have another round of give and take during ratification. So slaves will be counted as the three fifths of a person. And then after 20 years, Congress has the power to regulate or outlaw the international slave trade. And, and they did. In 1807, Congress did exactly that. All right. So as far as that, then the executive branch. Now, one thing that we need to remember as well is that the articles did not have an, a dedicated executive branch and there was no federal court system. And so a president of the United States to have somebody that is the, the person who is in charge of administering the government, that this is going to be a single individual. They, de they debated several things like, do we want to perhaps make this a committee or something like that. Now, how do we elect this president? It is through the Electoral College. One of these days, I want a shirt that just says electoral. And it's just, you know, there you go. That's where I went to college, right? Don't apply to the Electoral College. Don't let anybody talk you into applying to the Electoral College. Now, as far as that goes, this is how we elect the president. So each state will send electors to vote for the president. And as far as that goes, now, the Electoral College is not, strictly speaking, a Democratic, like, national election, but the Electoral College is the sum total of 51 distinct Democratic elections. And this is what we have to understand about the election of the president under the Constitution. It's not a national election. We want to remember the difference between national and federal. And so the Electoral College was designed to be a federal system. So the states send their votes, okay? So even today, it is the electoral vote. So the states send their electors depending on who won the presidential election in that state. And so each state will get a number of electors where it is the number of senators, plus the number of representatives. So for, for example, my state of South Carolina has seven representatives. And so therefore we've got nine electoral votes. So you add the senators. Now, why do they do this? It's one of those things that the large states get more electoral votes. All right. The large states get, so California gets more. Okay. California gets more than Wyoming, but the small states get a head start. So if you live in Wyoming, your vote, uh, you know, Wyoming's say in who's president is proportionally larger. Now, in real terms, it's much smaller, but it's proportionally larger than California. So when you look, uh, when you look here at the 2012 presidential election, you see California has 55 electoral votes, but then Wyoming, Montana, North and South Dakota, Vermont, uh, you've got several of the 
of these states here that only have three or four electoral votes. And Wyoming gets three electoral votes for like 500,000 people that live in Wyoming. And so proportionally, those small states get a little bump. But then again, states are impacted by presidential elections. And so then, you know, that's where you see kind of how they, you know, we see them in their electoral power. Now, the judicial branch. So the Supreme Court of the United States and the judicial branch is really not, uh, you know, it's it's not as well defined. It really just says there will be a judicial branch. There will be a Supreme Court and lower courts that Congress can establish. Now, the Commerce Clause is very important. So when we're talking about tariffs, as far as going from the Articles of Confederation, where the states had complete control over commerce and the federal government had zero economic powers. What happens here is that the Congress will have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with Indian tribes. Congress will control interstate commerce. Now, What's important here to note is that the states will still control intrastate commerce. So again, we see federalism because with the Commerce Clause, the states, if it, if commerce originates in the state, then and, and, and it is done all in that state. That's why you pay a sales tax. Like when you go somewhere and you buy something, a physical good that is in the state, well, that's intrastate commerce. Now, then when you're putting goods across state lines, states cannot charge sales taxes on that. Now, then the other thing is amending the Constitution because the articles were nearly impossible to amend because you had to have everybody, all 13 states had to agree. And so what happens here is they want it to be difficult to amend, but not impossible to amend. And so we see that two thirds of Congress, now we could talk about the Article 5 convention, which has never happened, but it may happen at some point. The states can actually have another meeting to propose amendments, but every amendment so far that we've had has gone through Congress. So two thirds of Congress plus so Congress basically proposes amendments. Now, remember, Congress cannot uh, amend the Constitution unilaterally. Congress cannot amend the Constitution. They can only propose and then send it to the states. Now, three-fourths of the states have to be on board with this. So the states ratify or reject an amendment. So as far as that goes, Madison is saying here that the amendment process, it needs to be enough to where we can have, you know, where we can amend the thing, but not so much to where the thing's being amended all the time. So that's the thing. And so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, uh, you see the Constitution is taking sovereignty, not just to, to the states, but it's shared foreign relations. The federal government holds on to all powers that it had previously. Uh, as far as taxation, now the federal government and the state governments can tax. The Commerce Clause, interstate commerce, and then representation, the House and the Senate as the result of the Great Compromise. A concurrent majority, instead of just two-thirds of the states, a concurrent majority of the Senate and the House and the president's signature. And instead of needing the consent of all the states to amend, two thirds of Congress plus three fourths of the states. Now, let me go ahead and go back to the questions. All right, so we've got some things here. Let's see, the great compromise, okay. I don't think, Brittany, that we will see the great compromises, the Sherman compromise. I don't think that we're going to see Roger Sherman on your exam. And so the great compromise, and it may, you may not even see it referred to as that, but this compromise, between, and really remember that 60% of your AP US history exam is stuff that you generate, okay? So Brittany, remember that on the multiple choice, it's all put there in front of you, but the majority of the exam is you generating your own evidence. So as far as that now, if you said the Sherman compromise, they'd probably know what you, the reader probably know what you're talking about. But yeah, typically you would say the great compromise. And so as far as that, the significance, okay, the upper and the lower house. Now, um, as far as that goes, 
the upper and the lower house, it's really more symbolic than anything else. Now, remember that the Senate has a few powers like we see with the confirmation hearings, treaties go before the Senate. So the Senate is known as the upper house really because of its prestige. All right. The Senate is more prestigious than the house. Like if you say like I'm a U.S. senator, that has more clout than if somebody says I'm a U.S. representative. So but both houses have to approve any legislation that passes Congress. So the Senate doesn't really have any grounds to like, they can't overrule the House on something, and you know, any more than the House can overrule them. So, you know, and then also all revenue bills, all bills that have to do with taxes have to start in the House, but that's getting into some AP government stuff. But as far as that, the Senate is the upper house because it's more prestigious. And remember initially that senators were, were appointed by state legislatures. All right. The, did the Constitution make who more united? What more united? I just see them. All right. So was so. OK. So the thing is that now this is something, Jackson, that I what I would say here is to note that. Perhaps the American Revolution made things more democratic, but it's really more republicanism. And the and and that's you know nuanced. We're a democratic republic, but you can have a republican form of government and a government that's responsive to the people without it being a democracy. And so, as far as that goes, uh, that really the Constitution, what you'll see from the anti-federalists who are arguing against the ratification of the Constitution, is they're saying that the Constitution is it, it's not it's not democratic enough that it's actually decreasing the amount of democracy and decreasing what the average person can do. All right. So as far as that, uh, I would say that we want to note that the anti-federalists did say they claimed that the constitution as it was, was not democratic enough that it actually undermined democracy. All right. So as far as that now, the the citizen Ghana affair. All right. So understanding Brittany, I think that context is something that's very important here. OK, that the context here is, of course, Washington's foreign policy. And I've got a video on this. If you search for George Washington's foreign policy now. America had to figure out, like, where where are we going to be? The United States, a new country, and separated from Europe by an ocean. Now, of course, Washington and Jefferson both end up seeing this as advantageous. Now, as Secretary of State, Jefferson was more likely, Jefferson is more likely to say, we need to back France, okay? We need to back France with this. But uh, Washington was like, look, our best interest are actually in being neutral. So Citizen Gane, what he did, okay, so when you send ambassadors, so when a country, like when France sends an ambassador to the United States, uh, they send an ambassador to the United States government, not to the people of the United States, all right? So the thing is, Citizen Gane comes to the United States and he knows that there's a lot of anti-British sentiment. So he starts having meetings with the people. He comes to South Carolina where all, uh, you know, all rabble rousers will go eventually. Right. And he has these public meetings and he starts raising money and commissioning privateers, basically like, hey, I've got a boat. I want to help the French Revolution. I want to shoot at the British. And so he was signing people up. But remember, an ambassador is an ambassador to a country's government, not an ambassador to a country's people. So, you know, like one time I actually found myself sitting down at a restaurant with the Canadian ambassador to the United States. He had a conversation with us, but sometimes he was careful about what he said because he wasn't, he, you don't want to be in a position where you're trying to influence the people who live in that country. So Washington dismissed Citizen Gane as his uh, as the French ambassador. He said Citizen Gane is trying to drum up support for his country with the people rather than being a uh, you know being a person who's 
coming to communicate with our government. The HBO John Adams series is about 10 years old, but it's really amazing. And it goes into that. But basically, and Washington, actually, Citizen Genet was like, please don't send me back to France. They're going to cut my head off with the guillotine. And Washington actually gave him asylum in the United States, told him, you can stay here. You don't have to go back. And so Washington was pretty cool to him personally. But Citizen Genet went beyond what was, uh, you know, what was permissible for someone who is an ambassador to a country. And so you need to understand that in the context of Washington trying to create a neutral foreign policy for the United States. All right. And as far as that goes, Kim, you're asking a republic and a democracy. Okay. Yeah. And so the United States is a democratic republic. And we, of course, have the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And when it comes down to it, we all believe in maybe some form of democracy, but we also believe in a Republican form of government. Now, a Republican form of government is a government that is responsive to the people. So if you've ever heard of the divine right of kings, it's like a divine right monarchy. The monarch gets his power from God and then rules the people because God wants him to. And so a Republican form of government, it is a government that gets its power from the people and it recognizes that its job is to serve them. Okay. It's to serve the public. And so there's, so, so a Republic does not need to be democratic. Okay. Now democracy is majority rule. 50% plus one, we do whatever. And the United States is not a pure democracy because the United States, and that's where we get into the bill of rights. Uh, we see that even if most people in the United States are a certain religion, then we see that somebody's religion is protected. And so they don't, it's just no matter how many people are against that religious group, as long as that religious group's not violating the law, then you know they have the right to that, to that religion. We have the right against unreasonable search and seizures. We have the right to speak freely. Oh, excuse me. Our First Amendment expression rights. And so those are elements of republicanism because the republic gets its power from the people, but it also has limits. And, and also a republic can be aristocratic. I've got a video on aristocratic and democratic republics. Those of you who are already in the 1820s, y'all might want to watch that video because that's timely for y'all. Because the United States was really founded as an aristocratic republic because it wasn't supposed to be a government that was controlled by majority rule. The whole point of the Electoral College it was to put some distance between the president and the people so that the president wouldn't be a faction leader and somebody who was subject to public opinion, but somebody who could run the government. So as far as that goes, that's really kind of the difference. Now, the United States being a democratic republic, uh, we are we are a democracy, but then again, not totally. OK, so as far as that goes, we've got that now Jay's treaty. That's another thing. Jay's treaty is also in my video on George Washington's foreign policy. And the Jay treaty was a very controversial treaty between the United States and Britain during the Washington administration. And so as far as that. Uh, the Jay Treaty, it was very unpopular. Basically, we gave the British most favored nation status. And in return, the British agreed to do things that they'd already agreed to do at the end of the revolution. So it was one of those things that it, it just it didn't end up being a good treaty for the United States. And it was there were effigies people would burn of John Jay, like they would make a little straw man, John Jay, and they'd burn it. And, you know, the Senate approved the Jay Treaty 20 to 10, which if it would have been 19 to, if it would have been 19 to 11, it would have failed because treaties have to get two thirds of the Senate, the upper house. So they have that privilege of doing that. Uh, so as far as that, that's Jay's treaty. And for more of that, look at my video on Washington's foreign policy. Thank you. Thank you, Zoe. Okay, so uh, as far as that goes, let's see. Can you explain what framers are? Framers, when we think about a house, a house is built on a frame, right? And so when you frame something, you build it. And the framers of the Constitution 
Uh, they are the framers of the Constitution are the ones who are putting together the Constitution. Think of the Constitution as a house. The framers are framing it. So the framers are the people who wrote the Constitution. When they talk about the framers intent, it, the framers intent, it means what did the people putting the Constitution together, making the Constitution? What did they do? You know, what, what did they mean by this? All right. Uh, where can we find these videos? Jackson, my videos are on YouTube. Just type in Tom Ritchie. Okay. So youtube.com slash Tom Ritchie. Then you can go there and that's where my video, my videos are. I've got a YouTube channel that's got a lot of videos for a push and AP Euro. All right. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, what was the point of, okay. Brittany, I'm not sure if I understand your question. I'm not sure if I understand your question that if they were going to follow the law anyway. Now, the big thing about the Alien and Sedition Acts is that they were a direct affront to the Constitution. So the Alien and Sedition Acts declared that any kind of scandalous or malicious speech against the government was going to be a crime. And that, of course, goes right against the First Amendment, which guarantees the freedom of speech and the freedom of the press. And so so as far as that, I don't think that Jefferson and Madison, I don't see the part of following the law. Now, Jefferson went so far as to write that it's, uh, you know, if, if the federal government commits an illegal action, an unconstitutional action, that the state can just ignore it. OK, so this is the beginning of nullification theory. For those of you who are studying the 1820s and Jackson, nullification theory really has its roots in uh you know in the in the virginia and kentucky or at least the kentucky resolution because madison did not subscribe to that doctrine madison believed that he was just interposing that the state is uh you know get coming between its citizens and the federal government kind of a time out sort of thing but jefferson was like if the federal government passes an unconstitutional law it's just the state has no obligation to pay it any mind. And that's, of course, where Calhoun is going to pick up and leave off. Now, remember, states' rights is kind of an interesting thing between the passage of the Constitution and the Civil War. It's it's almost like when you're at Chuck E. Cheese's and those little like gopher, you know, that little game where the, the gophers are coming out of the ground and you're knocking at them. And so, you know, there'd be a states' rights thing. And then it's like, bam. And you think, oh, states' rights went away. I got that. And then it's like, boop, states' rights. And then bam, bam. And, and it's just, it just keeps coming back. And you keep hitting it. It keeps coming back. And so there you go. All right. The XYZ affair was... It's not something that's a huge thing, but it is something that shows that the United States was basically being ignored by there were there were tensions. You need to understand that as an episode in the quote unquote quasi war. And that's really the Alien and Sedition Acts and the XYZ affair and all of that kind of stuff. That's all part of this quasi war, this undeclared naval war between the United States and France. All right. So let's uh, let's see here. OK, let me go ahead and go to this one. Zoe's asking about the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist. OK, so let's go ahead and talk about the Federalist and the Anti-Federalist. And so this really are these are the parties. Uh, they're the kind of a temporary party system. It's not like a real party system in the sense that it's a long term thing, like with the Federalist and the Jeffersonian Republicans. But let me go ahead and pull this up for y'all and show you just a real quick thing here. Now, the Federalists, these are the people who supported the ratification of the Constitution. And they picked their own name here and then categorized their opponents as anti-Federalists, which the irony here is that the anti-Federalists actually were more federal in their view of a government. So the Federalists supported ratification. And what the Federalist papers are asserting, Madison, Hamilton, and Jay, what the Federalist papers are asserting is that the government, the Constitution creates a government that is both federal 
and Republican. Now, by federal, we mean that it has room for the states, okay? Because the concern of the anti-federalists, they were opposed to ratification because they said the Constitution creates a government that is neither federal nor Republican. So they argued that this Constitution, it may look federal, but it's going to create a national government. They said things like the Supreme Court is eventually going to strike down laws passed by the states. Imagine that. And look how powerful that Supreme Court has gotten. Now, remember that the Federalist Papers, okay? Now, but let me get before I go to the Federalist Papers. But the Anti-Federalist said that this government is not federal. It is, it is not a balance between the states and the central government, and it's not Republican. Now, remember, a Republican government just means that that government is responsive to the people. It's accountable to them. And so if a government is not Republican, then it is autocratic. It is aristocratic and monarchical. So you see the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. Now, the Federalist Papers, so before that, let me go ahead and note this question is answered. And let's see, the Federalist Papers, how much is needed to be known about them? Okay, so for this class, now, of course, for AP government, you would get into things like the substance of Federalist 10, okay? So James Madison, uh, who's writing Federalist 10 about a large republic and a small republic and that sort of thing, Brutus number one. Now, for the for this class, I, I believe for A push, knowing Madison, Hamilton, and Jay, and knowing the overall purpose of the Federalist Papers, because the Federalist Papers, the point was not to explain the Constitution. The point was to actually, uh, the point was to sell the Constitution. All right. So Hamilton is really a, you know, really just I mean, Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton was such a con artist. I mean, it's, it's just, it's one of those things that he's writing like when Hamilton was like, this constitution doesn't need a bill of rights or anything like that. Uh, you know, we, we, don't, we don't need this. And so as far as that goes, remember Hamilton's goal, his ultimate goal, and he, play, he showed his hand in the anonymous atmosphere of the Constitutional Convention. He said, I want a national government. And that's what Hamilton's going for. And so with that, we see here Brutus, uh, number one, the anti-federalists and all that. And so the anti-federalists are arguing you can't have a large republic. Uh, you only can have small republics. And this government is going to turn into an aristocratic monarchy or something like that, but some sort of autocratic government. So I don't think that necessarily for a push, somebody doesn't need to know like, oh, Madison wrote in Federalist 10, which they're going to need to know for AP government. But understanding the purpose of the Federalist Papers was to promote the Constitution and to try to get it ratified specifically in the state of New York and understanding that the who the anti-Federalists were and what they were afraid of. Now, one thing that I think I've seen on a push questions before is understanding that the big point of contention that really the settlement, excuse me, that's made between the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists is the inclusion of a Bill of Rights. And so as far as this goes, when the Anti-Federalists said this government's going to be autocratic, well, it made a lot of anti-federalists happy when a Bill of Rights was added to the Constitution. So that's something that we definitely want to note as far as that goes. All right. So let's see, going uh, going from that. Uh, OK, and I think we've already got that, Logan. So we've already gone over them. Now, then I've mentioned that I've got YouTube videos, stuff like that. Now, as far as a similarity in Hamilton and Jefferson's ideals. Now, Julia, am I doing somebody's LEQ for them? I'm suspecting here. I've invited you on screen so you could chat with me if you'd like to. All right, let's see if she might join us. Because the thing is, they're really like Jefferson and Hamilton, like now, of course, they both 
like the Constitution, even though it's not what neither that's not what either of them wanted. So Jefferson, one video that I've got on my YouTube channel is called Jefferson and the Constitution, not love at first sight. So when Madison, you know, Jefferson had no hand in writing the Constitution. He was actually in France as an ambassador at the time. And so with Jefferson, he looks at the Constitution. He's like, you know what? I kind of like this whole Montesquieu thing I've got going here uh, with three branches of government. I like that there have been some additional powers added because the government needed some additional powers. There are some things like you don't see anti-federalists railing about the Commerce Clause. There are a lot of people who thought that was necessary. And that the government needs to have the power to tax and stuff like that if it's going to be a legit government. And so as far as that goes, Jefferson's like, you know, there are some things about this that I like, but there are other things that I'm not too crazy about. He didn't like that the original Constitution didn't have any term limits for the president or for uh, you know, for the president or for Congress. Now, of course, we still don't have term limits for Congress, but we have term limits for the president now, thanks to George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. And then, of course, for the 22nd Amendment after FDR broke that precedent. And so as far as that goes, Hamilton. So Jefferson's like, you know, this is probably a little further than I would have gone for Hamilton. This hasn't gone as far as I would have liked for it to go. And so they're both trying to kind of manipulate uh, their, you know, they're trying to push the Constitution their way, whereas Jefferson with a strict construction, Hamilton with loose construction. And as far as this goes, I think the biggest similarity would be that they both, uh, at least I think Jefferson lost confidence in Washington later, but they both thought that George Washington was uh, the best man to hold the country together at that time. But I'm guessing from what, from the question here, Julia, I'm guessing that this is an LEQ prompt that y'all are having to do or something like that. But I, I would say that your exam will likely focus much more on the differences. But I do think that both Hamilton and Jefferson believed in a Republican form of government. Uh, you know, that's certainly, but, but it's really, I mean, the philosophies are very, very different. And so the role of the tariff in the founding of the country. So remember that before the constitution, everything was uh, with the states as far as economic powers. And so because of the constitution, the government can have a, can institute a tariff. Now, the thing that we wanna understand about the tariff in early national America, and for those of you studying Jackson and nullification right now, that's something that we want to definitely look at. Okay, so Jefferson and Hamilton here, the whole idea with the tariff, okay, there are actually two types of tariffs. A tariff is a tax on imports. And so any tariff is a tax on imports. Now there are two types of tariffs. There is a revenue tariff. Now revenue is money coming in. So a revenue tariff is a tariff for the sole purpose of raising money for the government. Now the constitution says that the the Constitution says here that the Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes, duties, imposts, and excises to pay the debts and provide for the common defense and the general welfare of the United States. Now, this unquestionably constitutional. Now, a protective tariff. Now, this is a tariff that is not passed to fund the government, but it's passed like we see President Trump is a fan of protective tariffs, uh, that tariffs pass to, to try to protect American industry, especially manufacturing interests. And this is where Jefferson's a big fan of the farmers. And then Hamilton wants to promote manufacturing. And so with that, we see that the revenue tariff is intended to fund the government with no ulterior motive whereas a protective tariff is intended to protect domestic industry and also to discourage imports. And that's where it gets to where it gets messy with the nullification crisis, because it's very evident that the tariff of 1828, the tariff of abominations, was not a tariff that was designed to raise money for the government, that the government's like, okay, we'll just skim something off the top of something that's coming in, that these tariff rates were prohibitive to try to manipulate the economy. And Jefferson and his party are very laissez-faire. Now, I'm 
thinking that that would be a good topic next time to talk about the early Republic, Jefferson and Hamilton and all of that kind of stuff. Now, again, I'm so sorry about the late start of this thing. I was talking for about 10 minutes and then I realized that I wasn't actually addressing y'all. Next time I'll know that if I don't have the option to answer the question, to start answering the question, then I'm not broadcasting. So sorry about that, mea culpa. Y'all go ahead and throw out to me, are there any topics that y'all want to focus on? I'm thinking right now, seeing where y'all are, it's probably best if we focus on the administrations of Washington and Adams next time. So what we might call the Federalist era. Uh, and then we can move on to the Jeffersonians uh, late, later on, but I'm thinking that's going to be fine. So, but I'll take questions from the Jefferson presidency. I'm sure people will probably be there later. All right. So ladies and gentlemen, thank y'all very much for joining us and I uh, hope everything was helpful and I will see y'all next week at the same time. It's always a pleasure. Austin Garrett. You're welcome, Zoe.